Welcome, Motenta people. Doris Day compared herself to those round-bottom circus dolls that you could push down and they'd come back up. That's how she had always been. No matter how far she was knocked down, she always got back up. She had been through everything worse, but she always wore her bruises with pride. Her name was Doris Day, and she was aware of her inner strengths. Why Doris Day's husband wanted to kill her? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Matentas channel. Doris Day, 50s Girl Next Door. How did she endure the pain with grace? America's Girl Next Door, carefree and brimming with joy, Doris Day was known for her melodious voice and roles in innocent romantic comedies. Back in the 1950s, Doris was a talented and charming leading lady who had a unique talent for comedy and who sang like a dream. She appeared alongside everyone from Rock Hudson and Frank Sinatra to Cary Grant and James Stewart, and millions of American women began to look forward to her as a sort of every woman heroine. Her personal life, though, was undoubtedly less rosy. She was a rosy-cheeked icon of Eisenhower-era wholesomeness, but as soon as the counterculture appeared in the 1960s, she went completely out of style. But because she was stereotyped as the perfect girl next door, her typecasting brought an outstanding cinematic talent's career to an early end. Day's overbearingly beautiful public persona and the chaotic reality of her personal life stood in stark contrast to one another. Do you want to know how? Watch this video till the end to know what life threw at her and how she came back stronger every time. She was born Doris Mary Ann Kappelhoff in Evanston, Cincinnati on April 3, 1924, and most people know her by a stage name she hated. Doris, who is of Dutch and German descent, was deeply affected by her parents' divorce when she was eight years old, but she sought and found comfort in her first true love, dance. She actually had a lot of hope in that field until a bad vehicle accident put an end to her professional aspirations in the middle of the 1930s. Blonde, attractive, and energetic Doris began studying singing as she recovered from her accident since she seemed to have an innate drive to perform. She was confined to a wheelchair and was so bored that she listened to the radio all the time. Jazz and Ella Fitzgerald in particular captured her attention. She later recalled, There was a quality to her voice that fascinated me. I'd sing along with her, trying to catch the subtle way she shaded her voice. By the time she was 17, she was playing live music with the band's leader, Barney Rapp, and it was he who suggested she drop her long last name in favor of a simpler day. After performing with various band leaders, such as Les Brown, she started to gain attention for her clear, lovely voice and eventually recorded a single titled Sentimental Journey. When the song was first released in early 1945, it quickly became an anthem for the returning soldiers, and Day's voluptuous features made her a perfect pinup. She traveled the country in the immediate post-war years with Bob Hope and other performers, and she rose to fame as a radio performer. When Day relocated to Los Angeles in 1948, Betty Hutton's pregnancy forced her to withdraw from the movie Romance on the High Seas, and Day was selected to take her place. Her presence on screen drew everyone's attention, and she was cast in other soulful historical musicals as a result but she wasn't acknowledged as a true celebrity until she played the rebellious American West legend Calamity Jane in the 1953 film. Following the release of that film, Dora shot to the top of the list of leading females in romantic comedies, showcasing her actual comic talent. It's unjust to dismiss Doris Day as a one-dimensional boring performer. Early in her career, she displayed a darker side in Storm Warning, portraying a Southern newlywed terrorized by a cult. She was even more fascinating in Love Me or Leave Me, a biopic of Trouble Torch singer Ruth Edding, co-starring James Cagney. She also played a journalism professor in Teacher's Pet, who was courted by Clark Gable's rakish city editor. In that role, she was stern and poised. Day, however, thrived in comedy, and because of this, she can rightfully be compared to other outstanding comic actresses like Katherine Hepburn and Carol Lombard. She appeared in Pillow Talk with Rock Hudson in 1959. She had never performed in a rom-com before, but she was brilliant as a woman who grows angry with a conceited composer she shares a phone line with. She and Hudson complemented each other very well and starred in two more successful comedies, 
love her come back, and send me no flowers. Day, moreover, was confident enough to compete with Cary Grant, the master, in that touch of mink, and she complimented James Garner well in the thrill of it all and darling. More than anything else, those movies helped to solidify Day's reputation as an upright and unspoiled Midwestern woman for whom a dirty idea had never crossed her mind. But in reality, the 36-year-old diva had already entered into her third marriage by the end of the 1950s. When Doris was 16, she was married for the first time. Although Doris was only 16 years old, she was already far from immature when it came to men. Early on, she was exposed to the harsh realities of life. All her life, she strived for unattainable ideal family life. Do you know why? Because she never saw that bliss of marriage in the lives of her parents. It was my only goal in life, she claimed, to be a housewife in a good marriage, not to be a dancer or a Hollywood movie star. Unfortunately for Doris, despite becoming a wife four times, she would never have a happy marriage, largely because of the bad men she chose for herself. Trumpet player Al Jordan was the man whom she married at the age of 16. Jordan was terrible news since the start of their relationship. He appeared to be eager to reflect macho dominance. He betrayed Doris, beat her up, and publicly humiliated her. One could almost hate him for criticizing her table matters, given that Doris enjoyed eating hamburgers with absurd amounts of ketchup and raw onions after shows, usually in Jordan's car as they drove home. She would also frequently drop pieces of food all over the place. His mood swings could not have been helped by her habit of talking with her mouth full and spitting. Soon after they started dating, she went on a weekend trip in Jordan's 15-foot motorboat with him and other band members from their group. Sign of the drum. Jordan raced in a swell of a paddleboat, trying to reach full speed. The resulting waves caused the craft to overturn, and the passengers were nearly drowned. They were saved by a passing boat manned by a local reporter, and their near-tragic story made the front page of the Cincinnati Star. Although Doris's mother urged her repeatedly not to engage with this maniac ever again, the incident just brought them closer. Doris agreed when Jordan proposed to her. Even after Jordan left the band to join another one and started a cross-country tour, the engagement remained strong. He committed to stick with her, and she was obligated to wait for him. That was the time when Doris joined Les Brown's band of renown, and soon she was touring across the country. Doris informed Les Brown that she was leaving the band after the tour in order to be married. She was in love. Therefore, she disregarded his request to reconsider, even though he and her mother Alma attempted so. She insisted that her career was unimportant. Between matinee and evening performances in New York, where she was finishing her notice, Doris got hitched to Al Jordan in the spring of 1941. The last-minute reception took place in a nearby Greasy Spoon. Jordan observed Doris kissing a fellow musician on the cheek the very following day as she expressed gratitude for his wedding gift. In their room at the Whitby Hotel near Times Square, he beat her senseless after dragging her through the streets and up the stairs from the theater. His nasty behavior had only just begun. Despite the unpleasant aspects of their relationship, she was thrilled when she soon learned she was pregnant and imagined Jordan would be too. But as soon as she broke the news to him, he grew furious and beat Doris so violently that she nearly miscarried. But can you believe that Doris still refused to leave him? She had no idea that he could even try to kill her. Jordan got a gun four weeks before the baby was due and put it in the glove box of his car, waiting for the right time to kill her and then commit suicide. One day, he pulled the car over into a lay-by and shoved the gun's nozzle into her tummy. She was able to stop him anyway, but when they arrived home, he attacked her. Doris had a lifelong phobia of being in the front seat of a car. After the birth of their son Terry in 1943, they both got divorced. When she finally got rid of him, though, she went into a severe depression. Even a weirdo like Al Jordan, in her opinion, was preferable to having no male at all. Now that her childhood goal of marriage and happy family life was shattered, it appeared as though nothing would replace it. In reality, it was the finest thing that could have happened for her career and for her health. She didn't speak to Jordan again after the divorce, when she found out he had actually shot himself in the skull sometime later. She didn't shed a tear. By 1946, George Wheedler, a saxophonist, had become Day's new husband. On the wedding day, March 30, 1946, 
Doris proclaimed that she had finally found the right man and they would have a happy, successful marriage. However, the marriage was not any more successful and they were separated after three years. Her romantic scenarios appeared to have finally altered in 1951 after she was married to independent film producer Martin Melcher. He ended up being her de facto manager and was a producer on many of her most famous movies. The couple was married until his sudden death from a heart attack in 1968. He also adopted her son, Terry. Doris found out at that point that not everything was as it seemed. When Day learned that her husband of 17 years had quietly spent her $20 million inheritance and left her with significant debt, it was all too clear that friends like James Garner and Frank Sinatra's concerns about Melcher were all too well-founded. She later filed a lawsuit against Jerry Rosenthal, his business partner, in an effort to retrieve some of the inheritance. But she was compelled to make an appearance in a primetime TV light entertainment series that her husband had agreed to without notifying her. The shock of everything happened at the same time she lost popularity. By the late 1960s, flower power and the women's movement had started to make Doris Day seem outdated despite the fact that she had made over 40 films and as many hit records up to that point. Other stars were able to adjust, but because Dee was so closely tied to the wholesome housefrau stereotype, it felt like she had no place among the swinging 1960s stars. She just gracefully retired. She occasionally appeared on television and released a few more records. By the late 1970s, she had retired to her Carmel estate, where she took care of a large number of rescued animals. While filming in Marrakesh for Alfred Hitchcock's Man Who Knew Too Much, Doris's fierce commitment to animal welfare was awakened. Doris had reportedly been traumatized as a teenager when her pet dog was struck and killed by a car while she was walking it. Day dedicated her life to the cause of animal rights after she was horrified by a terrible treatment of camels, goats, and other animal extras during a scene at a market. She established rescue facilities, started a national spay day, and invested a significant amount of her personal savings in animal welfare programs. She was married one more time in 1976, but as was to be expected, her marriage to restaurant manager Barry Comden did not last. After the divorce in 1981, Doris centered her focus on the animal welfare organization she had founded. She was assisted in this by her accomplished record producer son Terry, but he tragically passed away from cancer in 2004 at the age of 62. Despite her severe isolation, she continues to be a subject of curiosity for the Hollywood tabloids, which fiercely report repeated glimpses of her rescuing dogs left on the motorways of Los Angeles. But she has always been seen by her devoted followers as the glamorous but good-hearted ideal girl next door. Most of the songs on Doris Day's first album in nearly 20 years, My Heart, which she released in 2011, three years after receiving a Lifetime Achievement Grammy Award, were songs she had previously recorded for Doris Day's best friends, but had never seen a commercial release of. In the lyrics of one of her biggest hits, Que Sera Sera, What Will Be Will Be, Miss Day encapsulated her tragic philosophy. She disliked unhappy endings. She admitted to one interviewer that she disliked it when a hero or heroine perished. She always wanted to see just happy endings. However, nobody ever lives happily ever after outside of movies. My animal family has been a source of joy and strength to me during the hard and depressing periods I've suffered during these past years, Day said to Mr. Hotchner. I've discovered that when you're seriously troubled, you can acquire things from your pet's silence, a loving company that you can't get anywhere else. She continued, I have never found loyalty equivalent to that of any pet in a human. She endured a lot over the years, including violent relationships and unhappy marriages, as well as battles with illness, financial disaster, and controversy. Still, she never gave up on life until she died of pneumonia at the age of 97 in 2019. Even if the not-so-beautiful life of the gorgeous Doris Day lacked the love and companionship of humans that she craved, one thing is certain, her on-screen image will always be irreplaceable. Do you think there will ever be another Doris Day? Share your thoughts in the comments section below. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. It is incredible for me to see how dramatic these stars' lives have been. This video is another example for that. Did Lana Turner's daughter kill her mother's boyfriend? Let's find out the details here.